Hello and welcome to week three of victimology. This week we're going to be talking about victimization in the United States, an overview, but that's the title of the week. But what we're going to be talking about is statistics and where we get our information. Okay. There's one violent crime every 27 seconds. There's one property crime every four seconds in the United States. So let's break this down a little bit more because the Uniform Crime Report has eight index crimes. Okay, and the Uniform Crime Report is currently the premier Bible, I guess we call it the Bible of Crime in the United States or the crime tracking. It is published every year by the FBI's Jura, uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics. And they tell us that there's one murder every 36 minutes. There's a rape every four minutes. There's a robbery every 1.6 minutes. There is an aggravated assault every 39 seconds. Now, there's a burglary every 20 seconds. There's a theft every five seconds. There is a motor vehicle theft every 41 seconds. Uh, this is what's called or what's described as the time clock. You can find it on page 93 on your textbook. But how do we come up with these numbers? How do we understand these numbers? How do we come up with these numbers? Victimologists try to answer questions like how many people are harmed by criminals each year? How badly do they suffer? Is victimization becoming more of a problem or less of a problem? Okay. Is it subsiding as time goes by? Or is it stagnant? Or is it... Uh, okay. Um, or is it going down? Yeah, I have a book over here on my bookshelf. It says, Why the Crime Rates Fell. Uh, the notice to decrease in murder uh, starting in the 1990s, about 1996, and started decreasing until uh, 2016, uh, at least till 2016. Okay? But they ask these questions. They want to find out where and when the majority of incidents occur. Where are most of our criminal events taking place? Okay, and they want to determine whether predictors on if there are predictors or whether predators are on the prowl intimidate or subjugate their prey. Do offenders stalk and intimidate their prey and subjugate them to some form of humility were bare hands used were weapons used what kind of weapons were used you know and they look into all of these things and they get this information or to answer these questions it's necessary to construct uh, statistical portraits okay we have to look at statistics and if you've ever taken my research class you'll know that i'm not a big fan of statistics because we can make statistics say what we want them to say. And we'll get back to the criticisms of statistics later. But when you look at statistics, it gives you an image of the big picture. Okay? And it gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, and this big picture can serve as an antidote, antidote uh, to uh, impressions given to the public based on direct but limited personal experiences. Okay, so we want to focus, and this is where the, the narrative comes in, is we want to look at the statistical support for these things. Okay, the big picture is constructed by making sy systematic observations and concrete measurements on the local level. Sorry about my phone. 
Uh, let me, it's going to get noisy around here, so I'm going to turn it off. These reports from the village or this, the town, the city, the county, the state reports are aggregated to enable victimologists and criminologists both to figure out what has been happening in the region, in the jurisdiction, in the state, in the say, let me, hold on a second. This, all of this, um, I'm looking for a research assistant intern to help me log all of this information. But this is all of the key index crimes and the numbers of the key index crimes that have occurred in the city of Odessa um, That's 2019, 2020, 2019. So since 2019, um, 2018, uh, we're looking at the trends. And I'm going to write it. I'm going to do some research. Uh, and if I can get a research assistant to help me with this data uh, or data. Um, You know, I'm going to write a we're going to write a study on the effects of the oil field and the oil boom and bust on crime within Odessa. We'll see how that works. But this is what we do. We use these reports from the UCR, from NIBRIS, and from the NCBS as a way to identify or to create the narrative for important information to be disseminated amongst the peoples. Okay, it's crucial importance to social scientists, uh, policy analysts, and decision makers, because they want to know how they need to move forward. Okay. They want to know how things work and how they adjust. Statistics take and give concrete evidence to vague notions. We no longer need to use words like many or most or a majority. We can tell you that 97% of the people killed by police had a weapon. Doesn't matter what race they were. 97% of the people killed by police had a weapon, whether that weapon was a gun, a knife, a sword, a lighter and wasp spray. Okay, if you take a lighter and wasp spray, what you now have is a flamethrower uh, that you're using against police. Uh, that particular individual that got killed by police would happen to be white. And we'll get, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we can, using statistics, we can expose patterns of criminal activity. We can identify these patterns, and these patterns will reflect the predictability or the predictable relationships on regular occurrences that show up year after year after year. Kind of like this is a longevity, you know, 2019 or 2018. Some of my records go back to 2018. So that's 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. That's four years. Um, that's a lot of data and a lot of information to uh, put into a database to look for statistical anomalies. And then we can identify and we can identify these patterns. Okay. And we can find whether, you know, the patterns, for instance, of murder, the patterns show that most murders occur in urban areas over suburban areas, which is over rural areas. If you live out in a rural community, you're less likely to be murdered by somebody. Okay. Robberies uh, are mostly men over women. Uh, or is that vice versa? Well, the statistics are going to tell you. Uh, but these statistics can be used, can be assembled, can be put together to detect uh, trends. And these trends 
will illustrate how situations have changed over time, how criminality has changed over time, and how we can, as victimologists, we can create, suggest, recommend policy to help decrease crime in the future. And statistics can be used for planning purposes. Okay, they to project law enforcement workloads. We can look at the criminality that's going on in a community and project how many police officers we're going to need to hire over the next year or over the next two years. Uh, or if we can put a hiring freeze in because criminality and crime looks like it's going to go down. We can use statistics to detect to to combat or to make predictions uh, regarding those situations. Statistics can also be uh, computed to evaluate the effectiveness of criminal justice policies. We can use the statistics. Okay. okay. Um, at some point in your education, whether it's here at the undergraduate school uh, or at the graduate school, you're going to learn about public policy and you're going to learn about what's called SERA. SERA is an acronym for scanning, analyzing, response, and assessment. Okay. So what criminologists do and what victimologists do uh, is they use these statistics and they identify these statistics and they interpret these statistics as a way to create policy on how we're going to move forward using these statistics in a predictive manner. We're going to create policy to move forward. Okay? And I think this week's discussion kind of broaches that a little bit. This week's discussion, we have a discussion forum this week, and it is as an operations officer. So pretend yourself, you are the operations officer in a local police department. You've been tasked with assessing which criminal activities your department should most focus on based on occurrences and trends over the past few years, as reported by the UCR, the Uniform Crime Report. Which types of crimes can you make the best assessment based on the UCR reporting? You can use this same data and present it in a way to appear more alarming or more assuring to the public. How can this be done? Um, I can also recommend, okay, so if you are the operations officer for a local police department, uh, you need to find the information from the UCR uh, for that particular local community. So why don't you pick one? Um, you pick Odessa, Midland, Big Spring, San Antonio. Pick a Texas city uh, and go on from there. But you go to city-data.com, city-data.com, uh, type in the city that you want to put look for, and then when you get to that page, you scroll down. It'll give you the crime data from the UCR over the past few years, and it's, it'll show you uh, the four person crimes and the four property crimes, and you can address this discussion through that. Um, as the operations officer for the town that you chose. Okay, so statistics can be, you know, we can use that. We can say, you know, murder's down, okay, robberies are down, theft is down, uh, burglaries are down. You know, this is a positive thing. You know, how are you going to um, use this data to present it in a way to appear more alarming or more assuring to the public? And how do you go about doing it? Um, statistics can provide estimates of costs and losses uh, that are imposed by illegal behavior and illegal activities because it doesn't matter what the crime, there is going to be some form of loss. There's going to be some form of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, costs that are imposed 
uh, because of the legal legality. Estimates are based on accurate records that can be important or as accurate as we can make them. Um, they're used for commercial purposes. They're used by insurance companies. Uh, and that's one of the things that you see you, especially in the inner city of some of these really large cities, uh, Detroit, Dallas, <clears throat> it, they're being called food deserts okay? because Minneapolis, okay? a lot of these places where you've seen all of these riots over 2020, you see these businesses that have been burned to the ground and they're not reopening. And new business isn't going in because the insurance costs are going up. They're skyrocketing because so if I can't get insurance company to protect my business, to protect my uh, goods that I want to sell to the public, I'm not going to open a store there because if it's going to get robbed, it's going to get stolen. The insurance company is not going to insure me or if they do insure me, those insurance costs are going to be so high that I can't afford to pay them. You know, I know during that, I heard one quote from uh, <clears throat> a congressional representative over last summer, not this summer, but summer of 2020. They said, well, it doesn't matter if these people are stealing. All of this stuff is insured. Well, when you steal all of this stuff, the business owner, the property owner is going to file a claim with the insurance company and then insurance rates go up for everybody. Because the insurance company is going to make sure that they make their money. They're not going to assure something that's risky. So these statistics are used by insurance companies to dictate what your insurance rates are. Um, just like driving the car. They'll, they'll look at the number of DWIs. They'll look at the number of fatal accidents. They'll look at the number of accidents uh, in the location where you live. <clears throat> and then they'll adjust the insurance premiums to you based upon where you park your car at night. Okay, so when I lived in Big Spring, my insurance premiums were a lot lower than they are now that I live in Odessa. Okay. Odessa has a fatal accident at least one fatal accident a week. And we're killing 52 people a year just by driving down the road. Uh, there's a lot of truck drivers that are running around. You see all these commercials for these lawyers. Have you been injured in a big rig accident? Call me, long car. I should charge him. I should send him a bill um, for advertising on my lecture here. Uh, but you see all of these ambulance chasers they they can make money here fighting or chasing the truck companies and, and the insurance companies because there's a lot of accidents here so it's used by insurance companies to establish and determine their premiums and statistics can be used for planning purposes to project like i said law enforcement workloads they can also be completed to evaluate the effectiveness of criminal justice policies uh, and then how those policies are working and if they need to be readjusted. Statistical profiles can be assembled and created as a, to establish the impression of what is usual or typical about victims in terms of their demographics, their characteristics, such as their race, their ethnicity, their religion. <clears throat> Um, in 2020, after the George Floyd killing, we heard a lot about uh, statistics and that 36 percent, no, excuse me, 26 percent, 26 percent of the people killed by police are African American. And because the African Americans only make up 13 percent of the general population, that is a disproportionate over. A disproportionately overrepresented African Americans are disproportionately overrepresented within the community, and thus it must be systemic racism. And law enforcement is 
systemically racist and targeting African Americans. Okay, I'll get to my criticism on that for a minute, but you can turn around and you can use that statistic, right, to to show and to influence the narrative. Okay, I'm sure a lot of you and you guys can make the comments below here. Uh, here in the announcements, or you can make these comments in your discussion forums. I'll be reading them all. I'm not working tomorrow, but I'll come back on Wednesday and I'll start responding to your questions and your comments. I know Jennifer has already uh, posted in her discussions. She may want to edit a little bit. She may not. You might want to read it again after watching this lecture uh, to see if you want to adjust your comments. Um, I'm not saying you have to, just because I haven't read your comments. I'm just saying that you've already posted. Okay, mathematical findings can always be spun, and that's where I'm going. Mathematical findings, okay. If you look at the Texas death row, 36% of the people on the Texas death row are African American. 59% of well, 44% of the people on death row are white, meaning the remaining 56% are BIPOC. I hate that word. Black, indigenous people of color. Okay, so you can use that as a, you know, event to, or as a, an issue. You can use those statistics to support this, the systemic racism found within the jury system sending people of color to prison to death row more often than they send white people to death row numerically there are more whites on death row than there are everybody else but you know how do you want to handle those or discuss or to influence those decisions mathematical findings can also be spun and it's the way that you put it in the way that you uh present the statistics uh, the example used in the textbook is a battered women's shelter has 50 percent capacity which means only you know they've got 10 beds only five beds are being used uh, and because it's only half full uh, we can cut our funding because they don't need that much money they don't need that much expenditure um, because they're only using half of what's being provided or i can turn around and say there's oh you know it's already half full and this is an epidemic it's already half full and we need we need more funding because we don't know how many more women are going to need our help you know and we're at we're only at, we're already at half capacity we could fill up tomorrow you know it's a lot like the covid in the hospital you know we heard that the midland hospital covid section you know the covid the hospital at midland is full the overflowing in regards to covid well what they don't tell you is that midland hospital only has seven beds dedicated to COVID. So now you've got seven beds that are dedicated to COVID. All seven of those beds are filled and they are moving into the ICU uh, and they've got some beds in the ICU and they've got beds in the regular general population of the hospital. So they tell you that the hospital is full to overflowing with COVID so bad so much so that we can't take other people into the hospital. Not exactly true. Because there's only seven beds that are dedicated to COVID. Once those seven beds dedicated to COVID are full, the hospital's full. And you gotta send things, send to other places and other people. It's the way that you want to spin the statistics. Okay. And you need to identify the abuse and when people are abusing statistics, because statistics never speak for themselves. 
statistics has to have an interpreter, has to have somebody there to interpret what's going on. Okay, so let's go back to the law enforcement targeting people for death based on race. 26% of the people killed by police are African Americans as opposed to 13% of the general population. Thus and therefore, thus and therefore, police must be racist and must be targeting people of color um, for more death. Well, I guess you could say that. You could. Uh, I went to last year um, before the whole COVID scare started. I went to a discussion. I guess it was 2019. It was fall of 2019. Wow, it's been two years. I went to a discussion on racism and extremism. Has it been that long? It couldn't have been in 2019. I don't know when it was. It was sometime in the past. I think it was last year, last fall, or last spring. It was last spring. It was spring of 20, spring of, or fall of 20. It was fall of 20. And one of the speakers, it was on you know, the conference, the panel discussion was on racism. And one of the speakers started talking about Jim Crow and how the new Jim Crow is not voter laws, but the new Jim Crow is the prison system where we are sending a large proportion of African-Americans to prison. In fact, 43% of the prison population across the country is African-American. Whereas again, it's 13, 14% of the general population is African-American. Thus, we have new Jim Crow where we're sending black men to prison and we're tearing up the black family, uh, causing generational effects and generational problems. A little bit of a stretch, do you think? Are we abusing the statistics? Are we only looking at one tree within a larger perspective? Okay, so in January of 2020, I started a research project with the research class uh, called the fatal use of force by law enforcement based on race. And what we found as a class, we went through the statistics and we used the statistics. And yes, we confirmed that 26% of the people that are being killed by police were African American. And just looking at that stat, it would seem, it would appear as though the police are targeting African Americans at a greater number, but is that the whole picture? We continued to look and we continued to look at the statistics and we were continued to look at the reports. And we found that 97%, 97% of the people that are killed by police regardless of race, have a weapon. But we did find that race comes into question. Race is a factor. And that factor comes into on whether or not police are going to pull the trigger on an African American holding a weapon. We found, the statistics showed, that you were two and a half times more likely to be killed by police if you were white and having a weapon than if you were black and having a weapon of any kind. So what we found are officers are questioning themselves before pulling the trigger on an African-American because they don't want to be canceled. They don't want to be prosecuted. They don't want to have their town burned down. So you could turn around and say that, you know, because 80% of the cops that are killed in America from year to year are killed by African-Americans. 
that's disproportionately overrepresented. So do you think that these cops are being killed at a greater rate because racism is getting in the way of them pulling their trigger or even pulling their gun? Because if they kill this African-American, do they want the Michael Brown protests? Do they want the George Floyd protests? Do they want all of these other, the Freddie Gray protests, the Eric Gardner protests? Every time an African-American is killed by police, the city gets burned to the ground. So what the research, what my research and what the class's research showed was that people are killed because the threat they pose to society, not because they're black, not because they're white. Although race does come into effect because police officers are less likely to pull the trigger. Two and a half times more likely to pull the trigger on a white person than they are a black person. My research has not been published. Nobody will publish it because we, like I mentioned last week, We've got this world perception. Research finds bias because of the world view or the accepted perception. And statistics uh, can be used to create or to support that accepted narrative. Some mistakes are honest and some mistakes are unavoidable. Uh, but when statistics are used to prove a point, their origin and interpretation must be questioned. Okay. I am using the 30 the 26% killed by police to prove the fact that cops are racist. You want to look at that. You want to question that. You probably even want to question my own statistics that I've shared with you. You want to look at why this was brought up. And, you know, one of the criticisms was that um, of my paper was that I am not that that I am using rhetoric that is against the Black Lives Matter movement. And because my rhetoric violates or is against the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, I just this paper is not going to be published. Um, but you want to look at the data, not just this, not the interpretation, but where do you find the data? Where did the data come from? What are the key variables and how are these key variables operationalized? And what was counted uh, and what was excluded by the researcher and why was this information excluded by the researcher? Now, President Trump, I know a lot of people don't like President Trump, but You'll get over it. Um, he set up a commission on the harm on the. He wanted to track how many Americans were being harmed by illegals through criminality. Now, a lot of the supporters of this research turned around and said, you know, they believe that cr illegals that commit crime is a major problem within the United States. And that's why we need to uh, keep illegal immigration to a minimum and we need to increase deportations and we need to not let people come into the country until they have been properly vetted. And you know, this is because illegal immigration creates a lot of crime. His critics um, suspected that the problem was a minor issue and that illegal immigrants, uh, undocumented immigrants or whatever you want to call these people who have illegally entered our country, think that their criminality is a minor thing. It's not something that you need to worry about. And what they did in order to silence Trump and to silence this research is they started screaming racism. And you can hear this anywhere that you go, everywhere that you go, um, that Trump is a racist because he called Mexicans a bunch of rapists. 
and a bunch of criminals. My interpretation is he didn't say that, but I understand where they're coming from because he said that illegal immigration is the largest. It's a major problem. I don't know if he said it was the largest problem, uh, but he did say that it was the criminality caused by illegal immigrants was a major problem in the United States. The rhetoric, the mob turned that into President Trump being racist. And you can go up and down 42nd Street and you can ask people if Trump is a racist and why you think Trump is a racist. And they're going to refer to this study. Uh, so it doesn't matter uh, what the study comes back and shows, whether or not illegal immigration uh, causes or increases criminality. Nobody's going to believe it. Nobody's going to accept it because it's been labeled as racist and that, you know, the variables are racist in nature. So victimologists should be and must be committed to objectivity. They must point out the shortcomings and the limitations of their data collection. Okay? That if they are not giving you the shortcomings, they're not telling you the bad side of their claims or the negative side or the oppositional side of what they're claiming, they are academically dishonest. And this is something that you need to make sure that you avoid above everything else. You do not want me to label you as academically dishonest at all. So there are two official four sources, three official sources, but there are two major, the two major official sources as the Uniform Crime Report, which I've already briefly discussed. There are eight parts. There's two parts to the Uniform Crime Report. The first part is the index crimes, and then there's part two. The index crimes has four person crimes and four property crimes. The person crimes are murder, sexual assault, robbery, aggravated assault. The four property crimes is burglary, theft, or larceny, motor theft, and arson. Eight. And these, this information, um, these index crimes, is what we uh, can be compared. The level of index crimes can be compared from city to city to city, the locale to locale to locale, and you can gauge the seriousness of crime and criminality uh, within that community. You can identify crime problems within that community. Part two of the Uniform Crime Report has 21 other assorted offenses. Okay. There are no estimates of the total number of offenses. Yeah, because if you remember in your intro class, they talked about systems uh, and management systems and the models of criminal justice. And there's the funnel model. Okay, there are, are a thousand crimes. And of those thousand crimes, only 600 of them are reported on the average is what we find. Um, or that's the number that's given in the, in the funnel model. Um, so there's no estimate of the number of total offenses that can be that that are made, that are committed uh, in the Uniform Crime Report. Okay. And they only register the you know the Uniform Crime Report only registers the crime and criminality that leads to arrest. If there is no arrest, there is no record of it. They also track sexual offenses against women and children. Okay, and they categorize them in two different areas. There's crimes, sexual crimes against women, sexual crimes against children uh, that are not rape and that are not prostitution. So there's incest, there's pedophilia, there's um, what other sexual offenses are there that are not? Um, indecent exposure, 
Uh, those kinds of crimes are listed here in part two. Prostitution has its own little section, and in 2019, there were over 80,000 prostitution arrests that were made. Um, so the shortcomings of the Uniform Crime Report is underreported, period. Many victims don't report the crimes that are against them, and a lot of crimes don't get, there, there is no arrest. So it doesn't affect. Okay. The second shortcoming of the Uniform Crime Report is that it focuses on accused offenders, not victims. Okay. So the Uniform Crime Report focuses on the offenses made not the victims created. So it's the Uniform Crime Report is great for the criminologist, not so good for the victimologist. Third is um, it lumps together attempted and completed crimes. It, it doesn't tell you, without looking at the individual police report, it doesn't tell you whether the crime was completed or if it was an attempted crime. And then complete competing or completing um, crime rates of the different various cities. Um, because police agencies are not going to want to, you know, they're going to They're going to try to manipulate the data so that they don't become the murder capital of Texas or the murder capital of the United States. Okay. Another shortcoming that's not listed at, in, right there is the way that it's reported. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are four person crimes and four property crimes. So in the rate of importance, and the Uniform Crime Report only logs the most important crime. So it would be murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault. Then it would go down to the person crimes. Um, I mean, the property crimes, arson, vehicle theft, burglary, and theft. That's the importance. So, and I know the example that the book gives was pretty cool. A uh, bad guy breaks into a house. That's burglary. He finds a woman in there and he rapes her. That's rape. Then he steals all of her jewelry. That's theft. Then he steals her car and drives off. So of those four crimes that just occurred, all they count is the rape. You know, it would have been funny if I would have said all they count is the rape, but I didn't do that. So um, all they count is the rape. They, they, the burglary was there. The breaking and entering was there, but that's not counted in the UCR. The theft was there, but that was not counted in the UCR. And the auto theft was there, but that's not counted in the UCR. All they count is the most egregious offense. So in an address, in, in an attempt to address this shortcoming, they've established NIBRIS. NIBRIS is the National Incident-Based Reporting System. Now, the National Incident-Based Reporting System will report every single crime that committed in the incident. So now we have the same example. There's the burglary, there's the rape, there's the theft, there's the auto theft. There were four crimes that were committed. All four crimes are counted individually. Even though it was one event, they were counted four times, they counted all four crimes. And this gives you a better number of, a better understanding of the criminality that's going on in the United States. I like the NIBRA system, but the NIBRA system is a lot more extensive uh, and it's a lot more comprehensive reporting system. Austin, Texas was the first to switch to this system and the first to implement it back in the 1990s, uh, 96 or 97, I think. 
Uh, other large cities like LA and Detroit, New York, uh, have trouble meeting the goals and expectations and the timetables of Nimbus, so they haven't implemented it. It's hoped that Nimbus will be fully in use by the end of this year, uh, but there's been hopes that Nimbus would be fully implemented a lot of times in the past, and it's always been extended. So it'll, in my opinion, it'll probably be extended again. Yeah, but the Nibris system gives a lot more education, a lot more information about the crime and the criminality that's going on in, in, in the community. It helps victimologists a little more as well. But we're still missing that dark figure of crime. Okay. And I know, you know if you've had any classes with Dr. Kit Bush or Professor Hammond, you have heard about that dark figure of crime. And what victimologists attempted to do, we first tried to do this in 1966, so 55 years ago. We tried to track crime victims. And the first survey was called the National Crime Survey, uh, where they went out to 10,000 homes uh, and they interviewed the residents of these homes um, from the age of 16 and up every six months. Well, that tended to be a little too hard, too difficult. So by the 70s, it was gone and it wasn't being used anymore. Uh, it was reestablished with President Clinton in 1996 as a crime victim survey. And then was revised again to be called the National Crime Victimization Survey. And it's a 20 page, 20 page survey with 100 questions. They visit tens of thousands of people and they talk about the crime, but it's a self-report study. So what are the what are the major problems with a self-report study? Well, not everybody's willing to self-report. Not everybody's willing to admit to the criminality that they've committed or that has been committed against them. Is a you know, is a woman willing to talk to a complete stranger about being date raped? We know that one in four college freshmen have been victims of date rape during their freshman year. I have seen some statistics that say one in three women in this country, one in three women, that's a third of the female population in this, in this country, have been forced to perform sexual activities against their will or against their, um, well, their consent. They felt pressured into committing these sexual activities. So with a raise of hands, how many of you suffer from date rape or a victim or a survivor of date rape? You can raise your hands. Okay, well, I don't know if you raised your hands or not. I can't see you. But the question becomes, how many of you said, yeah, I was a victim of date rape, and you really weren't? Or more importantly, how many of you raised your hand say I was or refused to raise your hand? And you have been a victim of date rape. How many of you uh, have been beaten up? How many of you? have been robbed? How many of you have been swindled out of your life savings? You know, you can keep going on and on and on. Okay. The, another problem with that is there are some people, uh, it's called memory decay. Um, that was so traumatic, they keep repeating it every year. You know, every six months when they go, you know, they talk about that. I was raped. 
I was robberized, robbed that, you know, somebody robbed me, somebody burglarized my home. You know, it just goes on and on and on and on. And they keep bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up because it was so traumatic to them. They think that it happened a lot more recently than it actually did. Okay, so those are the three sources of information where victimologists get their data, where criminologists get their data so they can do research. Okay, so I'm at 50 minutes and the powers that be don't like our videos being this long. So I'm going to stop here. I'll see you in the forums and we'll pick this discussion up in the forums. Um, if you want to address anything that I said specifically in this lecture, you can place those comments below. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in the week three module or the module three discussion. Have a good day.